Okay, guys, good evening to everybody. Uh, is everybody logged in? Uh, there's a request for a lot more. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good. And uh, can you also see my slide? Yes, sir. Okay, Nikhil, can you just take over to make sure people get admitted into the meeting? There are a lot of people requesting. I don't know, this is a new uh new thing from uh, from zoom so just uh, in between go to the controls and see if you can admit the people into the meeting okay uh, yes sir right now there are 84 we have a few more login 85 yeah but you 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 keep admitting them in because they cannot uh, log in until and unless you admit them okay uh that's the new security issue there so just go to that manage participants and then just say admit Participant. Let me first pause the resume recording. Enter a little louder. We can't hear you properly. Little louder. All right. Okay. I'll speak up a bit. My volume uh, may be low. Okay. All right. Let's let's get on with it. All right. We are we are at hundred participants. So let's get on. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about malignant superior vena cava obstruction, or uh, also called as SPC syndrome. Uh, quite a straightforward topic, actually, not very complicated. Uh, most of you have come across this. Most of you probably understand the principles of management, but uh, it will be a good revision for all of us to go through, particularly for the exam going people, uh, because a couple of MCQs actually come from this. Uh, and I can point out to you where the MCQ uh, lies in the lecture. So it, it is something which you can definitely get 100% in the MCQ. So, uh, it's worthwhile revising this topic with me. Uh, there is no real guideline on this, okay? There is no real guideline out there because it's not a very common disease. Uh, so they really haven't got enough randomized control studies or whatever. But the one paper in the literature which has actually given you a very good uh, uh, analysis of the SVC syndrome is this one which got published in 2011 by Philip Lepper uh, and uh, Hamacher's this, uh, group. Uh, and uh, they have spoken very well about the SVC obstruction, particularly talking about the malignant uh, SVC obstruction. So I'll try and talk you through the malignant SVC obstruction and try to make you understand uh, what is needed for the exams. Uh, one minute, what is in my hand? Let me move this out of the way so you can see better. Okay, so uh, SVC obstruction is, SVC syndrome as we call it, is, is a conglomeration of uh, symptoms secondary to SVC obstruction. Again, before I start, can you just switch off your microphone, everybody? There are some microphones on, so I, I am getting distracted. Uh, uh, Switch off microphones, guys. Okay. The obstruction can be intravascular or the obstruction can be extravascular. Okay. So this is important to realize because the pathology can be outside the SVC or the pathology can be in the SVC. Any of this can cause an occlusion of the SVC and give you a set of symptoms which together form the complex called as SVC syndrome, okay? So the extravascular compression is usually because of a rigid pathology outside the SVC. The SVC is a collapsible structure and any pathology which is rigid outside the SVC can start to cause compressing on the SVC. And in fact, uh, symptoms do not really appear almost up to the point when the patient is uh, almost 90 to 95% compressed. And that is when you start getting SVC symptoms. But predominantly the SVC uh, accommodates the pressure that comes from outside. And the commonest pressure which comes from outside, as we all know, is a tumor. Any tumor in the anterior mediastinal uh, area can cause it. And we know there are four specific tumors in the anterior mediastinum, which are the four T's, which are called as uh, Thymic tumors, uh, which is thymomas, or they can be uh, thyroid, which is a retrosternal uh, goiter, or they can be T-cell lymphoma, 
or they can be teratoma or a germ cell tumor. So these are the four which are commonly present in the anterior mediastinum. And these will cause compression on the SVC from the medial side because they lie medial to the SVC. Uh, the one thing that will cause compression from the lateral side is usually lymph nodes. So the other cause for compression of the SVC and extravascular compression will be inflammation or fibrosis. And inflammation of fibrosis can be seen either in mediastinal uh, sclerosing fib uh, fibrosis or in uh, tuberculosis or in sarcoidosis. So any of these can actually give rise to an inflammatory response, which might actually cause compression on the SVC. The intravascular component, which usually will cause SVC uh, obstruction, is thrombus. Okay. Uh, other very rare things like intravascular tumors uh, are not very common at all uh, within the SVC. So we don't uh, really talk about that. But nowadays, because interventional cardiology, interventional radiology has become so uh, widespread, the incidence of thrombus has gone up quite dramatically. So very often you see the obstruction of the SVC secondary to a th thrombus, which is usually secondary to an intravascularly placed device. Okay, so you will see that as we talk along. So let's start off with the very basics as we always do. So what is the anatomy of the SVC? Uh, SVC lies in the superior mediastinum. Everybody knows the location of the SVC. The length is usually about five to seven centimeters long. Okay, and it, if you ask for the external or the surface anatomy of the SVC, it extends from the costochondral junction of the first rib to the third rib on the right side. So this is the superficial anatomy or the surface anatomy of the SVC. Uh, it forms from by a fusion of the right and the left brachiocephalic vein. Uh, the right brachiocephalic vein is formed by a fusion of the right internal jugular and the subclavian vein. Uh, the left is formed again by the left internal jugular and the left subclavian vein. Okay. The azygous vein is the only real structure which drains directly into the SVC. So on the right side, the azygous vein comes across uh, and drains into the SVC just before it enters into the right at atrium. The main function of the SVC is to transport blood from the head, neck, and upper extremities. And importantly, it carries almost one third of the venous return. But the problem is not that it carries one third venous return. The problem is the areas from which it carries venous return are very, very critical, mainly the brain. So anything that causes SVC obstruction will cause back pressure changes and it's not such a good idea for the patient. Okay, uh, SVC, as we said, drains into the right atrium. Right. I'm getting repeated messages that people are waiting. Uh, what is the message? Uh, Okay, all right. Now let's carry on and, oh, sorry. So let's look at the picture. The picture is very, very simple, very easy to understand. The IJV, right, left, SV, uh, subclavian vein, joining to form the brachiocephalic. And on the right side, the uh, on the left side, the left brachiocephalic coming down. These are the internal thyroid uh, veins which brain into the left brachiocephalic and together they join. The azygous, as we know, joins it here to the to the lateral side of the SVC. Okay, so azygous is really one of the main things that drains into the SVC. But the important thing is not just the azygous. The important thing is to understand the anatomy of the collaterals of the SVC. So there are many, many collaterals which are present, which when the SVC is blocked, they open up and uh, manage to dissipate the pressure. So the important collaterals that we have are the collaterals of the azygous vein, uh, we have the intercostal veins. All of the intercostal veins we know drains into the azygous and the hemiazygous arch system. Uh, we have the internal thoracic uh, vein. And then we have the abdominal vein, which is the epigastric, the superior and the inferior epigastric uh, veins, which actually uh, will show back pressure changes when the SVC is uh, compressed. So there is a whole system network of collaterals Hence, uh, the, the back pressure changes, if it happens slowly, there is always enough time 
for the collaterals to open up. And so the patient may not be very symptomatic till very late. It really takes a lot of the SVC to be compressed, almost more than 95% before the patient really starts to become symptomatic because the collaterals open up. Of course, if there's an acute uh, obstruction of the SVC, secondary to a thrombus, then there is not enough time for the collaterals to uh, open up and those will actually cause compromise in the patient, a clinical compromise. So if a patient uh, acutely goes off, always think of intravascular problems rather than extravascular because extravascular slowly increase and compress. Intravascular come in suddenly like a thrombus. Uh, so what happens is when you get obstruction of the SVC, there is increase in the venous pressure. There is back pressure and edema of the head and neck and upper extremities, predominantly caused by tumors in the mediastinum. And uh, the cardiac output is reduced acutely. If the cardiac output is reduced acutely, it usually means that there is a intravascular uh, compression. Whenever there's an extravascular compression or it's a slow compression, there will always be collateralization. The general uh, papers that have looked at all this have said that the hemodynamic changes that happen are due to mass effect on the heart rather than the SVC obstruction. So it's not really the SVC obstruction directly which will cause, particularly in extravascular compression, it's not the SVC obstruction. But because the tumor is increasing and causing pressure on the heart, that is what causes hemodynamic compromise in these patients. And so that's important to remember. Okay. Now let's look at what are the etiologies of this, of SVC syndrome. Historically, before uh, the, you know, 2000s and 1980s and 90s, historically, the major etiology was syphilis, always. It was syphilis and tuberculosis. Almost 15 to 40% uh, was secondary to syphilis. And syphilis classically was secondary because of syphilitic aortic aneurysms. So you got uh, syphilitic syphilitic aortitis, and then the aorta became aneurysmal and in, increased in size, and that caused the compression of the SVC and subsequently caused SVCO. But nowadays, we don't see syphilis. Tuberculosis is also because the drug and medications have become pretty good, and we start treating these patients pretty early. So infective complications are lesser. Uh, the more common complications now are because of tumors. So 90% of patients are because of tumors. 30% uh, actually are thrombotic complications. In the previous generation, we did not see that many thrombotic complications. And most of the thrombotic complications that we see now are because of intravascular devices. Because more and more catheters are being put, more angioplasties are being done, uh, and uh, various other uh, devices are being used. Hence, you're seeing a lot more intravascular thrombotic events. So this is an example of a syphilitic aortitis uh, and a, a large aneurysm of the uh, arch of the aorta, which is going up and compressing on the SVC. This is an area of the SVC. Can you see that? That's being compressed. And uh, this is the one that used to be seen in the last century, but not, not anymore. These days, we don't see them. They're very rare. The other uh, areas which can compress on the SVC is thoracic outlet uh, tumors. Thoracic outlet tumors come from the lateral side. All other tumors, I said, come from the medial side. So the thoracic outlet tumor or uh, like a neuroma, schwannoma, or a pancos tumor, any of these can actually cause compression on the SVC. Uh, another important uh, type of tumor which happens in this area is germ cell tumors. Where I have seen quite a few germ cell tumors lateral to the SVC which are growing and causing compression on the SVC. So it is something that you have to keep in mind when you're trying to evaluate a patient with SVC syndrome. The important thing is very often the patients have no symptoms of the tumor and the first symptom that appears is SVC obstruction. So it is uh, really surprising how much the patient can take before the symptoms appear. This is uh, an angiogram showing you the obstruction very clearly um, below the uh, brachiocephalus. The left brachiocephalus is coming here and the SVC is forming almost like a rat tail, okay? So this is something that you have to keep in mind. So other etiologies that you will see are fibrosing mediastinitis. Um, I, I have seen a few fibrosing mediastinitis causing SVC compression. It's a very difficult condition because really there is no 
real treatment for the underlying cause. Very often we don't even know what is causing the fibrosing mediastinitis. Uh, there is some evidence that histoplasma capsulatum um, predisposes the patient for, uh, uh, for fibrosing mediastinitis. But again, the treatment with SVC uh, syndrome usually is just stenting. There's very little you can do for the fibrosing mediastinitis if it has reached that stage. Uh, of course, tuberculosis, actinomycosis, aspergilloma, uh, blastomycosis can all cause SVC syndromes. Uh, Bancrofti, filariasis, or nocardia, all of these can either form primary masses which will compress or can affect the lymph nodes which can cause a lymphadenopathy and cause compression of the SVC. The one thing that has actually been uh, seen more recently, uh, particularly in the last 10 years or so, is post-radiation of lo uh, and local vascular fibrosis, either secondary to AF ablation surgery or secondary to radiotherapy to the mediastinum. And this is, this, is a, this is a new phenomenon. This wasn't reported previously in literature, but now more and more case studies are coming in. Uh, case reports are coming in. Uh, there is really not enough randomized controlled studies or anything like that in SVC syndromes. The malignancy that typically uh, affect uh, are, as we said, more than 85% to 90%. Uh, traditionally, it will be non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which uh, at the apex of the, in the upper lobe, which will compress the SVC. You can have small cell lung cancer compressing the SVC, secondary to lymphadenopathy. Uh, you can have lymphomas uh, in that area and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's quite important not just to treat the SVC obstruction, but also to find out what is the underlying cause. And very often treatment of the underlying cause resolves the SVC obstruction. Uh, the other malignancies which we have seen are teratomas or germ cell tumors, primary germ cell tumors. Uh, mesothelioma can cause SVC obstruction, particularly by causing a fibrous reaction on the mediastinal pleura, and that will engulf the, uh, the SVC within uh, its growth, and that will cause SVC obstruction. Very, very poor prognosis when mesothelioma uh, causes SVC obstruction. And of course, we saw lymph node metastasis. So anything that can cause the size of the lymph nodes to increase uh, can cause this problem. Uh, lymph node metastases in the mediastinum particularly can come from ovarian cancer and other diseases. So it's important to rule out these things. So here is a chart from the uh, paper. Uh, and this tells you very clearly the whole uh, list of uh, list of uh, diagnoses that can be uh, that can be uh, present when you're dealing with an SVC obstruction. The important thing is this is a new one because RFA ablation for AF has been causing pulmonary artery stenosis and as a back pressure, it causes SVC uh, compression. So it is that that's a new one. Again, thrombosis is a new one. Almost 30% nowadays we see thrombosis related and predominantly because of intervascular devices, catheters, electrolytes, uh, catheters, electrodes, and things like that that have been placed in the SVC. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit about the etiology of SVC syndromes or SVC obstruction. Uh, there are many grading systems available. It is important to grade the SVC obstruction. Uh, there are two or three ways you can grade it. One is you can grade it clinically, depending upon the presence or absence of symptoms. And the second thing is you can grade it radiologically, depending upon the amount of uh, compression that is present in the SVC. Also, depending upon whether it's above the azygous, below the azygous, or at the azygous. So your report will actually tell you this is a grade two SVC. So when they say when they say grade two SVC obstruction, you need to know what is the grading system. So let's look at what are the grading systems. There's anatomical grading system, clinical grading system, and radiological grading system. Uh, so the anatomical grading system, which is present, is uh, a Dotty Stanford. This is a paper published uh, 2008, I think, and uh, it's a pretty good system which is used quite regularly uh, by James Dotty. He was the first author. And it divides the stenosis into four types, uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, one is 90% of supra-azygous SVC. Uh, two is more than 90%, more than, so this is up to 90%. This is more than 90% of supra-azygous SVC. Uh, type three is complete occlusion of the SVC with azygous reverse blood flow. 
and four is complete as uh, occlusion of the SVC with involvement of major tributaries and the azygous vein. So the, the, the obstruction is going into the azygous vein in type four, and those are not very good for the patient because they cause symptoms. So let's have a look at what is happening here. So here it is more than 90%. Uh, azygous is here, this is supra-azygous. So this is a type one, this would be a type two, 90 to 100% supra-azygous again and the back pressure changes are being felt in the uh, left side uh, the accessory hemiazygous will actually uh, take up the collaterals and um, if if the if the obstruction continues then you're losing the whole of the uh, lower end of the SUC plus the azygous again the left side takes up more of the uh, pressure so you get a back pressure change uh, down into the abdominal vessels as well so intercostals bulge up the abdominals bulge up, these uh, epigastric uh, vessels bulge up, and then up here, the back pressure will show on the head, neck, uh, and shoulder uh, veins. And then type D is where there is complete uh, loss of the azygous. In, in the previous one, there was still azygous coming in and being patent, but here the obstruction has gone into the azygous. So the whole of the system is blocked, and now the whole of the chest wall collaterals have come up and internal mammary vein collaterals have come up. So this is a way you actually identify what is the severity of the, of the uh, obstruction. Uh, there is a radiological grading where they go from zero to four. Uh, again, more or less uh, the same, but only difference is grade one has been further divided into one A and one B, which is with collaterals and without collaterals. Uh, this is the one that is uh, the this is the one that's recommended with uh, most of us uh, use actually this is based on the symptoms of the patient this is more important clinically the so you you got to look at the severity whether the patient is asymptomatic mildly symptomatic moderately symptomatic but the last three are the important if there is severe life threatening or fatal these are the ones where you intervene in an emergency these can be managed by treating the underlying cause. But the moment you get into this zone, uh, so SVC obstruction four and five, level four and five, that is when you have to acutely go in there and put in a stent so that you can reduce the uh, back pressure. You do not go for diagnosis first. You go for sorting out the SVC first because the patient is, doesn't give you enough time to do a biopsy and get a histology of what is causing the problem. And, and you'll be surprised because this is a slow insidious growth and suddenly it reaches a critical point. These patients may not present to you while they have mild to moderate symptoms and they end up suddenly acutely in your uh, emergency with severe shortness of breath, severe cerebral edema, headache, dizziness, and, and really critically ill. And so the first thing you do once you've done your CT scan is you just take them to the radiology room and put in an SVC stand. Uh, and that actually will save the patient's life. So this uh, grading is, is more important to us clinicians. Uh, so again, the same thing, but uh, it's, it's called as use classification um, and uh, similar uh, picture. But again, grade three, four, five is the one that you really need to uh, work at very, very urgently. Uh, there is a Bixby's classification for looking at surgical risk. This is, this was, prior to the era of uh, endovascular therapies. And so this was the ones where, should you operate on these guys or should you not operate? Nowadays, we just stent them. But in those days, uh, because there was no stenting available, you had to look at whether the patient was low risk for surgery with no physical signs and symptoms or high risk for surgery with the presence of physical signs and symptoms. So it's very important to understand uh, what uh, system that you're using. So what are the clinical features of an SVC obstruction? Uh, normal JVP is five, as we know, five to seven. Uh, there will always be a lot of back pressure. So obviously JVP will increase, uh, will go up to 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury. Uh, as a result of which there will be edema of the head, neck, eyelids, upper torso, and arms. You will know this for sure. You see the patient and you can diagnose an SVC syndrome. There will be grossly visible dilated veins which are not collapsing either on the chest wall or on the arms or it will be on the abdominal one. 
abdominal uh, wall. Uh, there will be cyanosis, there will be plethora, particularly in the sicker patients, grade three, four, and five. Uh, the worst is when you get edema of the larynx because they become acutely unwell and uh, they, they come in respiratory distress. So that is not a good idea. No, that's not a good situation. So anybody with edema, larynx or pharynx may need urgent intubation, uh, may sometimes need a tracheostomy depending on what is happening. Uh, if, of course, the recurrent laryngeal nerve gets involved, um, he will have hoarseness. There will be evidence of cough, strider, dyspnea, or dyspnea. All of this sometimes comes because of the presence of the tumor itself rather than SVC uh, obstruction. So it's kind of difficult to know what is causing what. But uh, between uh, the patient, he's, he's quite a sick patient. That's the bottom line. The SVC obstruction patient is a very sick patient when they turn up into your clinic. Uh, so you really need to act fast. So this is the classical uh you know engorged collateralization on the neck on the chest wall it's really classical once you've seen one patient you'll never forget this and every time you see this patient in a clinic you'll be able to diagnose it here is the epigastric collateralization this is because of superior and inferior epigastric vein there is a lot of back pressure and these vessels open up uh, so this is another idea this is usually a little more advanced the epigastric vessels don't open up that easily uh, because there's a long channel uh, of hemiazygous. So if the epigastric are starting to open up, start to worry that this is getting to be a serious problem. Uh, we said the JVP will be raised. Here is the JVP severely raised in the sick patient. Uh, there is a formation of these, uh, the, the capillaries, the venous capillaries open up. Uh, so it gives you like a telangiectasia uh, view. And this is usually seen in early uh, seen in uh, late cases where there is back pressure changes all the way up to the capillaries, okay? So before the veins come up, you get the telangiectasia and then the veins will start to come up. Uh, same thing, uh, you can see that the telangiectasia formed on the chest wall. So these are all signs. Uh, there is something called as infrared photography. If you do infrared photography, all of these dilated veins will be very clearly seen. But of course, you don't really need to do this nowadays. You have much better investigating tools, but there is uh, the availability of infrared photography. Of course, you'll get edema of all the surrounding tissues, head, neck, and uh, arm predominantly. I've deliberately not used a picture of the a photograph of the face because I don't want to identify the patient. So what are the life-threatening issues with SVCO? The life-threatening issues are cerebral edema, really problematic because the patient can go into confusion and coma uh, and that is that is a real real problem uh, but the beauty is you reverse the SVC obstruction with a stent and a lot of this gets improves quite dramatically uh, again the cardiac hemo, uh, uh, cardiac component can be compromised uh, you, you can get a hemodynamic compromise very quickly with the cardiac component and that's not very good for the patient. So as you can see, they can be very, very severe things. Uh, the one thing which worries you is when these guys come up with papal edema, because papal edema is always an indication that there is a raised uh, ICP. So you got to be worried about papal edema. Uh, if patients complaining about blurred vision or uh, conjunctival suffusion, which means a congestion of the conjunctiva, then look into the papilla and uh, make sure that he hasn't got any papal edema or raised ICP. Uh, one unusual complication of an SVC is because of the back pressure, you can actually get esophageal varices uh, and the patient may actually present with uh, acute hemoptysis, uh, hematemesis. So this is uh, very unusual, but sometimes they come with hematemesis and you wonder what is the cause. And the moment you get into the investigative phase, you see something in the anterior mediastinum, which is actually obstructing the uh, uh, SVC. So it is uh, very often these patients do not come with the primary pathology as, as with symptoms. They come with secondary uh, symptoms, secondary to obstruction of the SVC. So usually the diagnosis will be made late. Uh, here is the incidence of these things. Again, from that paper, the SVC in thoracic malignancy paper. So facial edema is the commonest thing you see uh, almost in 82%. Arm edema, distended neck veins, distended chest, chest veins, we spoke about that. Facial plethora, which means reddening of the face, uh, visual symptoms, okay? So quite important. 
Uh, the respiratory symptoms we mentioned, almost 50% have cough or uh, dyspnea, uh, and some of them have evidence of laryngeal edema because of the stridor. Uh, neurologically, again, with the back pressure because of the cerebral edema, you can have uh, these symptoms all the way up to coma and even stroke. So you've got to be really careful when you're analyzing a patient with uh, SVC syndrome. So what are the collaterals? What open up on the chest wall? Uh, what opens up? The chest wall uh, veins open up. We said that. The azygous, hemiazygous, and the intercostal veins are the main areas which take the back pressure from off the SVC. Uh, the lower torso or uh, via the IVC might actually open up. Uh, there is the internal mammary veins uh, and the superior and inferior epigastric veins. All of these form a collateralization and they open up. I showed you the picture earlier. And if it is a very high back pressure, it can go all the way down into the femoral area. And even worse is when the back pressure goes into the vertebral area and causes spinal ischemia. So it's really, really something that you've got to think of carefully uh, and treat urgently if the patient comes in stage three, four, or five. All assessment starts with history and clinical examination. Uh, a very good uh, clinical examination will actually give you the diagnosis. I've already shown you all the signs that you can see in these patients. It is mandatory that all these patients have a cardiac evaluation and also a CNS evaluation because you want to know whether the cardiac uh, side of things are compromised or whether the patient has got subtle CNS symptoms. Very, very important because if either of these are present, then you very quickly want to get in and sort out the SVC before you look for the diagnosis. So it's very important to do a good cardiac and CNS evaluation. And the box standard simplest investigation would be a chest X-ray and a CECT, either of which uh, will give you a very good clue as to what is happening within the chest. So this is a chest X-ray showing a large mass of uh, lymph nodes in the paramedias, uh, parasternal area, but uh, lying on the SVC and causing compression of the SVC. So just a simple chest X-ray, if interpreted well, will actually give you an idea of what is happening on the on the SVC. Uh, a CT scan, uh, usually a contrast enhanced CT scan, very important because you want to see the SVC and here is a mass, a tumor right in the anterior mediastinum going all the way into the posterior mediastinum onto the left side as well, into the uh, subcarinal area as well. And the SVC is almost uh, down to a narrow streak. If you see something like this, then the first thing which comes to mind is a lymphoma. You must try and rule out a lymphoma because the moment, you, here you don't even have to stent the SVC if he's not very symptomatic. Of course, if he's symptomatic, you'll have to stent it, but you might not get good uh, opening oh, of the SVC. Jaha ho rakhte hai pan. Aray, yeah, switch, off, switch off your phone, yaar, Sumit. Switch off your uh, microphone, yeah. Okay. So very often, if it's a lymphoma, it's a good diagnosis because you give chemotherapy and the guy responds very well and the SVC obstruction will go away. So it's important to understand the pathology. Uh, you can do CT venography. CT venography will actually help you to identify where the channels are coming and what are, uh, what are the back pressure changes. And you can clearly see all these vessels being lit up on the chest wall. Uh, and gives you an idea of uh, what exactly is happening. Uh, nowadays, with the softwares, you can do a 3D subtraction software on the, uh, on the uh, same CECT that you've done. Uh, it's a more, slightly more extended study, and uh, you do delayed phases uh, where you want to look into the veno, uh, venous phase and to see the, the dye moving into the collaterals, and then you do a 3D reconstruction on the console. The softwares are beautiful and you get excellent pictures of the collateralization of the SVC. So this is a tool that you must use a lot more. Uh, I don't know if you have access to this or not, but a good radiologist will be able to give you an excellent image of exactly where the obstruction is. The assessment uh, continues by using an MRI phlebovinography. So if you think that the obstruction is very acute, uh, is uh, is subacute, not very acute. If it's very acute, you've got to go for stenting. If it is subacute and you still want to analyze what's happening in the vein, then MRI is a very good tool. 
MRI gives you good idea of the vascular involvement of the tumor and whether it is how much is the extent of the uh, involvement. Uh, and, and it gives you a good idea of uh, how much it is, uh, what is the, uh, the grading of the, of the mass in terms of the obstruction. Uh, of course, because you're dealing with malignancy, PET scan is a very good idea. Uh, all in grade one, two, and maybe in, three, in some cases of three, you, you will actually do the uh, biopsy first, which, which means you're trying to find out the cause of the, uh, of the obstruction. So you'll do a PET scan, and then you'll follow it up with uh, a cranial CT or an MRI to see for the back pressure changes in the brain. And sometimes you also do a bone scintigraphy to see if there is anything else in the bones in cases of lymphomas and things like that. Uh, this is an MRI in geography, which clearly shows you beautiful delineation of all the blood vessels, shows you the collateralization, the IMA being uh, uh, distended, the collateral intercostals being distended. So it's a very, very good tool for looking for vascular involvement uh, in the chest. But of course, it takes a lo lot longer and the patient may not be able to lie still for 40 to 45 minutes for you to be able to do the MRI geography. Hence, CECT remains the gold standard in these uh, patients. Uh, again, now you're starting to look at what is the cause of the SVC obstruction. So bronchoscopy with endobronchial biopsy, cytology and BAL is, is indicated if the patient can tolerate a bronchoscopy, particularly in grade one and two. Uh, if there are mediastinal lymph nodes, then you need to biopsy these lymph nodes. You need a diagnosis, but please beware of doing it by mediastinoscopy. It is not a walk in the park to do mediastinoscopy with an SVC obstruction. I promise you this. The best thing is to get EUS or EBUS and biopsy it. You try to put an incision and try to get into the pretracheal space, uh, the whole collateralization changes the vascularity of that area and what is a relatively avascular operation. When you do a mediastinoscopy, you should actually have no bleeding whatsoever, but just the access to the tumor starts to bleed. And because there is back pressure changes, the bleeding does not stop. And you wonder whether you've actually damaged a major blood vessel. So it is, it is a nightmare when you're trying to do mediastinoscopy in somebody with SVC obstruction. So in the exam, if anybody ever asks you whether you should do mediastinoscopy, say no. Say I would do EBUS, EUS, or a ultrasound guided biopsy or a CT guided biopsy. But uh, mediastinoscopy is a real problem. In fact, many a times when they have not been able to get a diagnosis and they want me to get a diagnosis, I have actually preferred to do a biopsy by VATS so I can go in with VATS, have a look at the whole of the SVC, see the tumor and take a biopsy. There's so much space in the pleura and it's so much more safer because you will not cause that major bleeding that will happen when you go through a mediastinoscopy. So I personally, whenever I get a patient with SVCO who's had multiple biopsies, but they are unable to get a diagnosis, I am happy to go in with VATS and take a tissue biopsy rather than go in by mediastinoscopy. But you must do a good assessment to look at the peripheral lymph nodes, uh, because if it's a lymphoma, the biopsy may be uh, amenable either in the femoral axillary or some other area. So you will be able to uh, save uh, getting into the mediastinum. And of course, sputum cytology, pleural fluid cytology is present, but don't forget, send it for microbiology. You need to know if this is tuberculous lymphadenopathy. So it's quite important to have a good look at this patient uh, to find out the cause of the SVC obstruction, okay? So what is the principle of treatment of SVC obstruction? Always, always the first principle is to treat the underlying cause if the patient is not symptomatic from the SVC. It's only in grade four SVCO or grade three, four, and five in the, uh, in the clinical uh, uh, staging that you actually look for urgent venogram and stenting. If you, are going to be, uh, if you are going to be stenting or if there is thrombosis, then there is scope for treating it with anticoagulation. You can do it with a full systemic anticoagulation and that will help you to get over the acute phase of the SCC obstruction. And then you have time to biopsy and do other things. 
The problem is the moment you have anticoagulated the patient or you have stented and given anticoagulation, biopsy becomes a problem. And, and there is a risk of, uh, or risk of bleeding of this patient. So once uh, you have got over this phase, then tissue biopsy and staging is the most important treatment for this. Uh, and then depending upon whatever is the staging or the type of the tumor, you, do, you treat it according to the tumor specific, stage specific uh, plan. So completely depends on what you find. So this is the guidelines that you should follow. Let me just uh, move this away. Uh, let's move this out somewhere. How do I hide this? Okay, let's keep it here. Take a screenshot of this. This is from the SVCO paper, uh, analysis paper. Very, very good guideline. This is the guideline. Okay, this is very nice one. Very, very uh, nicely written. So look at this. You do a clinical assessment, medical history, physical examination. Oh, come on. Who is doing this? So you do a clinical assessment, medical history, physical examination, chest radiography, and CECT. This we said is common with all of them. Uh, if it is a malignant SVC uh, syndrome, uh, then if you know, think that is the cause, look whether it is compromising or not. So you have to stage the SVC. If it is uh, compromising or uh, you're in grade four uh, symptoms, uh, which will happen about five times, uh, five percent of the time. You got to go in for urgent venogram and stenting. Very important. Or if there is throm uh, thrombosis of the SVC, which is causing the problem, then go for direct thrombolytic agents if the thrombus is present. Okay. So this is the pathway when the patient is compromised. If the patient is not compromised, if he's got grade one, two, or three symptoms, uh, then go in for tissue diagnosis, staging. Most importantly, you must have a multidisciplinary dis discussion because the moment the SVC is got involved, it means that tumor is, uh, is, is more than uh, just a simple early stage tumor. So you got to, be, uh, you got to have a multidisciplinary discussion. It's mandatory. Of course, if the neurological symptoms are present, uh, look for CNS back pressure changes, but more importantly, look for brain metastasis. That is very important, okay? And then depending on whether the tumor is resectable, you can go ahead and operate on the patient primarily, or if the tumor is chemosensitive or radiosensitive, like small cell lung cancer, lymphoma, or germ cell tumor, you will give the chemo radiotherapy, uh, depending on whatever is the uh, treatment. And then you'll continue the treatment without SVC, uh, uh, without SVC uh, intervention. Uh, what's happening? You'll continue the treatment without SVC uh, intervention. If the symptoms are a bit higher, then you might have to consider stent and early radiation therapy. So you might give some treatment, and then if patient is still continuing to be symptomatic, you might have to give early radiotherapy or consider stent for these patients. Of course, it's a non-small cell lung cancer, the similar pathway depends on the symptoms of the patient. The bottom line is you can treat it either with primary surgery you can treat it with chemotherapy. You can treat it with uh, stenting and early radiotherapy. There is role for radiotherapy and best supportive care. And the last but not the least is surgical bypass. Okay, uh, surgical bypass is not a frequently done operation these days. Only, uh, only when you get into a stage where the patient has been downstaged with previous chemo radiotherapy, uh, particularly in the case of thymoma, that is when you get involved with trying to resect the residual tumor along with an SVC resection. So SVC resection is not a common surgery, uh, at least these days, okay? So it's important to understand that. Uh, so let's look at the various treatments that are available and we'll go through them. Treatments are meant to alleviate symptoms. So you, you keep the patient head high. Uh, intramuscular and intravenous arm injections are to be avoided. You should not give anything in the upper limb, particularly if the back pressure is high. Uh, all uh, intravascular catheters that are present in the uh, body should be removed uh, as soon as possible, the moment you start getting thrombosis symptoms. And the patient must be put through systemic anticoagulation therapy. That's quite important to do. Uh, steroids are only used in steroid-sensitive tumors, and in certain other situations, we'll talk about it. Um, you also use steroids in, when you've given external beam radiotherapy. 
to reduce the edema of the radiotherapy. Uh, and you can use diuretics to reduce the uh, preload of the patient. So you're trying to reduce the uh, uh, pressure on the heart. Uh, palliation may be used, particularly when you're dealing with terminal cancer. And the palliation principle is just put in an SVC, make the patient symptom free, and then give minimum therapy that is required. Irradiation used for palliation is usually a lower dose uh, yesterday, we said for mesothelioma, the dose goes down to 30. Uh, so you give a lower dose for palliation. Same uh, principle applies also for uh, anterior mediastinal tumors as well. Uh, and all you're trying to do is reduce the tumor mass so that the sim compressive symptoms are gone. You may also uh, use uh, chemotherapy as a primary treatment for the tumor. And the last is bypass surgery. And we'll talk about bypass surgery in more detail. I'll show you what we do. So what are the specialized therapies? Steroid treatment we spoke about. Uh, IV chemotherapy is uh, what we mentioned, uh, mega voltage external beam radiotherapy and insertion of an expandable metallic stand. The order may change depending upon the grade of the patient. Okay, so that's important to remember. Let's look at the endovascular therapies that are happening. Um, so whenever you're trying to stand the SOC, you try to approach either through a femoral approach, which is more commonly done, or you can go via a jugular or a subclavian approach, okay? The jugular and subclavian approach gives you a more uh, angulated approach. Uh, so the primary, most of the interventional radiologists try to go through a femoral approach. You, you, you use a nine French sheet to put it into the uh, vein. Uh, always give 5,000 international units uh, heparin intravenously. Uh, and the catheter that you use is a steerable hydrophilic perubo guide wire. So if you start with a steerable hydrophilic uh, guide wire catheter, which has got a very, very soft tip. So the soft tip allows you to manipulate uh, your guide wire through the obstruction. Usually these are tight obstructions, so you really need to be able to get through it. If you use a hard guide wire, you might actually cause a tear in the SVC. So you start off with a steerable a hydrophilic catheter, and then you move on to the uh, stiff guide wire, which is the amplants, this P-L-A-N-T-Z, sorry for the spelling mistake. Uh, so you then you put in a stiff guide wire, and then over the stiff guide, uh, guide wire, you take the catheter out, uh, and then you put in a self-expanding stent. So this is a standard technique that is used as, uh, similar for uh, when they're doing a coronary uh, angioplasty and things like that, uh, Seldinger's technique. So the, the stent that is available, uh, that is used and has been studied is Sinus XXL, which is a wall stent or uh, Sinus XSL, or you can use a wall stent, which is another type of stent, or you can use a Gian Turco Z. Any of these stents uh, are available. They usually try to avoid a metallic stent, try to stick to the more of the uh, silicon and things like that, and nitinol stents. The important thing with stenting an SVC is you must always oversize it. You have to oversize it almost up to 10% so that the stent fits snugly against the SVC and does not migrate. That is the important thing. So you must oversize the stent. Uh, the, as I said, it's the oversized 10% to prevent migration. Uh, before you can put in the stent, uh, sometimes you might have to dilate the SVC uh, before the stent passes. And in fact, even after the stent has passed, you might actually have to dilate it with a balloon angioplasty. So you do push in the stent over your guide wire, but you might have to dilate it with a balloon angioplasty to get maximal opening of the SVC. Uh, if there is a short stenosis on the SVC, you can try the balloon expanding stent. Uh, this is called as the Palmer or the Strecker stent. Strecker stent. Uh, these uh, are available uh, freely in the market. Uh, sometimes you might do bilateral stenting. When we talk about bilateral stenting, we're talking about the SVC and the brachiocephalic. So uh, sometimes if the obstruction is coming proximally onto the left side, you might actually stent the brachiocephalic in addition to the SVC. But most of the times you actually just stent the SVC and you will get away with it. So unilateral stenting is usually adequate. Uh, and the important thing is if you've only stented the SVC, then the occlusion rate is lower and the recurrence rate is lower, re-occlusion rate is lower. So the stent patency is longer with unilateral. Uh, 
And this has been studied in a couple of studies and this is the data that has come out of that. So if you can avoid it, preferably avoid a bilateral stenting. But of course, in some patients, you have to do it. This is uh, how the stenting looks like. Uh, they're passed in a guide wire there. The guide wire goes in, then you push in a balloon over it, try and expand it. And then the stent is passed into it uh, over the, over the uh, guide wire. Once the stent goes into place, you can either deploy it and leave it in there, or you can deploy it and push in a balloon and re-expand the stent. So both of them are used uh, depending upon uh, what is the need of the patient and how well it responds to the, uh, to the problem. Of course, it depends on the type of the, uh, of the obstruction. So if you are dealing with a, with a soft tissue tumor, with a soft tumor, it might open up more easily than when you're dealing with mediastinal fibrosis. Mediastinal fibrosis is really, really difficult to open up the stent. Uh, so it is, it is uh, completely depend upon what is the pathology of the obstruction. Uh, this is another diagram showing you the obstruction. There's a tumor from outside. You've put in a guide wire. Uh, the balloon is in place and you've got the stent in and the stent is within the balloon and it's open, uh, is within the stent. The balloon is within the stent and it is opening up the stent to make the patient uh, asymptomatic. Uh, again, similar picture showing you different types of stents that we are using. Again, can you see the root is femoral and they're coming from down here rather than from up here so that they can get a straight longitudinal access into that root. Okay, what are the complications? There are pretty, uh, these are not uh, procedures without complications. You can get pericardial tamponade. Uh, you can get pulmonary embolism because the thrombus may shoot off. Uh, even worse is stent migration. Stent can fall into the RA or go across the tri tricuspid and get into the PA. So this is not uh, something that you have to take lightly. Uh, these stents require anticoagulation and sometimes anticoagulation gives problems like pulmonary, cerebral or pericardial bleeding. So it is something that you got to keep in mind. Here is a, is somebody moving my slides or what is happening? I am really annoyed by this. Okay, so sometimes you can get pulmonary cerebral or pericardial bleeding and that's a problem. This is a CT scan showing the hemopericardium. Can you see here clearly the hemopericardium that is happening secondary to SVC obstruction and stenting? So it is, uh, it is a known complication and in fact, it might even cause uh, cardiac compromise and acute tamponade. So you've got to be careful when you're doing these procedures. They are not without their... Uh... What is that? Okay, this is a stent migration. This is a stent migration picture. You can see that the stent has fallen into the uh, RA. It is supposed to be here but because it was not oversized, it fell into the RA and that's not good for the patient because it then uh, causes uh, outflow obstruction for the patient uh, and uh, it has to be retrieved. They're actually now using a loop to retrieve that stent. Uh, you cannot redeploy the stent. Uh, usually you have to retrieve the stent and uh, start all over again. Uh, so that is uh, about endovascular stenting. What are the other treatment modalities available? External beam radiotherapy for, uh, for SVC obstruction was common before the stenting era. The problem with external beam radiotherapy is it takes almost five to 10 days for the effects to be seen. So even though the patient may come with an acute collapse, the radiotherapy to, come, uh, to uh, cause the tumor to die back takes five to 10 days, as opposed to that, the stenting is almost instantaneous. So nowadays, hardly anybody uses XDRT as a primary treatment. Of course, if you are in a center where you don't have access to stenting or a good interventional radiologist or a cardiologist, then you may use these techniques nowadays. Uh, radiotherapy can be used as a combination of chemo radiotherapy for treatment of the primary cancer. Uh, it, uh, there is evidence to show that it causes idiotypic effect, which means the radiotherapy uh, makes the receptor more sensitive to chemotherapy. So radiotherapy acts on the, uh, on the antibody receptor and it makes it more effective. That's the, uh, 
meaning of the word idiotypic and so it makes uh, chemotherapy act better on the on the tumor and shortens the overall treatment time and reduces the acceleration of tumor cell regrowth so a chemo radiotherapy in anterior mediastinal tumor may work better uh, and you should preferably use it concurrent rather than sequential if you are going to be treating cancers in the mediastinum and you have to use chemotherapy it's better to use them concurrently of course the patient has to be fit to uh, withstand this uh, therapy uh, what about immunotherapy non hodgkins uh, is and germ cells chemotherapy is enough sclc radiation or chemotherapy alone are enough uh, but nowadays with the world moving into genomics and molecular analysis they have started looking at a combination of radiotherapy plus cetuximab, uh, cetuximab uh, and there is some evidence now coming up uh, there are at least three or four papers which are saying that radiotherapy plus cetuximab may actually give you good results in patients with mediast anterior mediastinal tumors with scc obstruction to the to the effect that these tumors may be downstaged and eventually be fit for surgery um and and they, they work by this philosophy of overexpression of egfr receptors uh by the cetuximab it it changes the receptor quality and then the receptor becomes radio sensitive so something that was not radio sensitive before becomes radio sensitive so it's it's a good uh, modality to be used steroids i told you are used in lymphomas and thymomas very often uh, if you are not in a situation to offer svc obstruction or uh, uh, svc stenting or uh, radiotherapy then give them steroids particularly when you are thinking of lymphoma and thymoma and and there is some regression of the tumor and that might be enough to actually relieve the symptoms of the patient and then uh, later on give uh, the full therapy that you need uh, steroids are also used in post radiotherapy patients to reduce the swelling uh, because radiotherapy on one hand can reduce the uh size of the tumor but on the other hand cause edema of the larynx and so symptoms may regress but respiratory symptoms may progress so it is it is really a catch 22 situation so steroids are used aggressively when you are giving uh, radiotherapy uh, particularly for laryngeal edema that's the one that you got to be careful uh, so whether the edema is coming from svc obstruction or it's coming from the radiotherapy uh, you don't know but you have to use a high dose steroids to get control of the situation what about thrombolytics uh, local catheter directed thrombolysis is a known technique uh, increasingly being used particularly with the catheter related thrombosis uh, you can you have the option to do mechanical endovascular thrombectomy which means you go in via the uh, vascular route and use endovascular uh, forceps and endovascular scissors and endovascular uh, uh, something like a desjardins process and you grasp these uh, thrombi and take them out you can do a mechanical endovascular thrombectomy uh, but uh, there is uh, there is need for adjuvant thrombotic thrombolytic therapy after svc stents usually you need to give them anticoagulation for a long period uh, but you have to balance it against the risk of bleeding so at least for 3 to 6 months minimum but the problem is you got to remember there is another pathology which you have to treat so it's not just the svc obstruction is the other pathology that causes the problem and that is why you got to be careful about uh, balancing the risk benefits of giving anticoagulation so as i said 3 uh, to 6 months is mandatory uh, beyond that it completely depends on what is the response of the patient uh, endovascular and surgical uh, what about surgery surgery has been replaced by endovascular techniques completely uh, almost hardly ever we do uh, surgical uh, interventions uh, in the in the uh, current era uh, svc surgery has gone down quite dramatically the only place where svc reconstruction still has a role is in locally invasive thymomas in locally invasive thymomas we give chemotherapy first reduce the size of the tumor and then go in and do thymoma resection plus minus svc reconstruction occasionally in a smaller thymoma with svc involvement we would go in and do the s uh, thymoma plus svc recon uh, resection first and then do the reconstruction and then give chemotherapy as a follow up uh, regime so that that it depends on an mdt discussion uh, of course uh, in non small cell lung cancer as well there is a role for uh, 
surgery for the SVC. So there is a place for us to do SVC resection. Uh, so let's talk about SVC resections. Uh, there are many various techniques that are available for SVC resection. Uh, one is, of course, just, uh, you know, dissect out whatever you're doing. Uh, take out the tumor along with a patch of the SVC with a vascular control, and then you primarily suture the SVC over it. Uh, I have personally done these even by VATS, uh, particularly when I'm doing uh, 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 tumors of the upper lobe, which are involving the mediastinum. Uh, I have gone in by VATS, done the lobectomy from below, uh, got rid of all the vessels, and then lifted up the tumor along with the attachment to the SVC, put in a vascular clamp below it, and then cut off the tumor, release the specimen, and then suture the SVC. Uh, but of course, you need to be, uh, you need expertise to be able to do something like this. Uh, most people traditionally would actually do this by an open pericotomy technique. Uh, it doesn't matter whatever is your level of control, but you can do these uh, resections and safely take the uh, piece of SVC along with the tumor. Um, you can do an SVC to SVC anastomosis when you're doing a resection. Uh, you can do a left enominate to an SVC anastomosis, depending upon what you've done, or you can do a right IJV to SVC anastomosis. So it completely depends on what is the level of resection that you have done. Sometimes you might have to go on bypass as well to, uh, to get uh, this situation in. So here you are, here we have done a SVC uh, resection. Uh, we have connected the right IJV to this. And you can safely block off the left. You can tie off the left, just staple it off uh, because there is enough collateralization already happened. Uh, the patient will not be compromised with the back pressure. Uh, this is cancer surgery. So this didn't happen overnight. This was a slow growth over a period of time and the patient had enough time to collateralize. So you can safely just set off the left side and connect the right uh, IJV to the SVC. That is possible. Uh, you can do... Uh, this sort, so you can clamp off the right and then connect the uh, SVC, stump of the SVC or the base of the RA to the left side, left brachiocephalic, and you can put in a, a, a shunt uh, in the, across the mediastinum. The techniques to do SVC resection includes direct clamp and sew, uh, which I showed you earlier. You can clamp, clamp, cut, cut, and sew, uh, but you got to be pretty quick uh, so that you don't have a long ischemia time. You can also go on cardiopulmonary bypass. The moment you go on cardiopulmonary bypass, you have a better uh, control of the vascular system and the hemodynamics. And uh, particularly when you're going to be doing a more complex resection, it's better to go on bypass. The problem is when you're dealing with malignancy, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass in the presence of mal malignancy is not such a good idea because there is a risk uh, that your tumor cells uh, may be metastasized by the cardiopulmonary bypass. And the second problem is that to go on cardiopulmonary bypass, you need to heparinize these patients. And uh, hep heparinizing these patients makes your surgery uh, much more complicated and the risk of bleeding is much higher. So you really got to think carefully and hard before you uh, try to get uh, cardiopulmonary bypass involved in uh, malignancy surgery. Uh, but of course, you have to do it when you have to, when it's a very extensive resection. Most of the time when we do these sort of surgeries, very often we find that the phrenic may be involved. And if we do have to do that, then I personally do only one-sided phrenic resection. I will never do bilateral phrenic resection. And if I have to do a phrenic resection, uh, I will actually plicate the diaphragm on the table uh, so that the patient does not end up with being on the ventilator or with compromise of the of the respiratory system. I personally never ever like to do a bilateral phrenic resection. I'll never ever do that because diaphragmatic pacing and things like that is a very complicated situation and the patient will never get off the ventilator. And there's no point in doing such a extensive heroic surgery and then having a patient stuck in the ICU, uh, not able to get off the uh, ventilator. As I said, I will do the plication of diaphragm if I've done unilateral uh, phrenic resection along with the tumor. Uh, what about autologous vein? You can use autologous vein. You can use bovine pericardium. You can use arterial homographs. Completely depends on your setup. Wherever you are working, whatever you have got, uh, the SVC is is very very forgiving, and you can actually use any of these uh, any of these. Uh, uh, prosthesis for getting uh, a reconstruction of the SVC. 
Uh, so you can, you know, use bovine pericardium, you can use uh, whatever is available to you at that moment. There's a lot of things in, in uh, literature where different surgeons have used different uh, prosthetic material and reconstructed the SVC. Uh, so, you know, there is, there is very little data available around in the world because not many have done uh, huge numbers of these cases. And particularly now, uh, with newer chemotherapies, newer radiotherapy regimes, and better endovascular techniques, uh, more and more the SVC resection is going in the bin. Uh, here, here you can see that even though uh, we have done such extensive resections, there is still some evidence of uh, survival at five years. So it is worthwhile considering these patients for surgery. Uh, what are the outcomes? It depends on the etiology. Outcome completely depends on etiology. Uh, chemo and, and or radiotherapy relieves the SVCO in 77% of patients. So many a times you might not even need to stand the SVC. Just giving chemo and or radiotherapy will relieve, will relieve the obstruction. 17% uh, of them have recurrent SVCS. Uh, this is uh, directly from a meta-analysis data of all the published studies. Uh, Non-small cell lung cancer, 60% uh, will get relieved if you give them chemo radiotherapy. Uh, SVC stenting works in 95% of people. Very, very, very good outcome. Very good outcome, particularly when the patient is acutely compromised. And long-term as well, patency is maintained at 92%. So it's a very good technique and should be used uh, if you've got a patient. Uh, but the problem, of course, is if the patient has been given pre-operative, pre-therapy thrombolytics. If they've been given pre-therapy thrombolytics, it really, really becomes uh, difficult to do these procedures and morbidity does go up. And that is what the literature states. So coming back to this, it's very important. This is the one that you need to uh, write in an exam. Whoever is exam going, please take a snapshot of the screen. I'll keep this on for a few seconds. Please take a snapshot. And if you want, I am very happy to share this paper with you. Uh, take a snapshot of this paper. This is the one you have to read, and this will give you everything that you need in an SVCO. You, this will come as a theory question in DNB. Uh, I don't know how many marks, but it will come as a theory question. Uh, usually, SVCO comes as a clinical case uh, in the FRCS exam when you're dealing with chronic obstruction, not with acute obstruction. Okay, acute obstruction will never come. So, the, because the signs are so classical that we usually try to keep a case like this in the, in the exams. So to summarize, clinical features are striking but rarely require emergency intervention. Uh, the commonest cause is malignancy. Tissue biopsy is important to find out what malignancy it is. MDT approach is quite important. Uh, uh, hemodynamics compromise can happen. Laryngeal edema, all of this is an emergency situation. Uh, severe symptoms, endovascular stenting, the level of evidence at the moment is 1B. So first treatment that you must give in severe symptoms is endovascular stenting. And you can safely say the level of evidence is 1B. So there is more and more evidence coming out. XBRT is not common nowadays. Nobody's using it. Uh, radiotherapy and steroids following radiotherapy to prevent edema for SVCO is getting uh, some literature out there. So level of evidence is 2C, okay? So use of radiotherapy with steroids to prevent edema, but usually in the early stages, not in the uh, very acute stages. In, in chronic uh, SVC obstruction, you can use radiotherapy. Uh, in cancer settings, you, you can stent the patient first, then give concurrent chemo radiotherapy, uh, and that also is known to prevent tumor regrowth in the SVC. So concurrent radiotherapy, uh, stenting followed by concurrent radiotherapy uh, is one of the treatment modalities for, uh, for uh, SVC obstruction, secondary to malignancy. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's lymphomas or germ cell tumors respond beautifully to chemotherapy, okay? So you must look at chemotherapy as a first option, uh, first option when you have SVC or secondary to these diseases. Small cell or non-small uh, carcinomas can get Chemo radiotherapy 1C because this uh, this is an advanced disease. You can give chemo radiotherapy and you will get very good response with these disease and the SVCO will uh, go away. Again, the level of evidence is 1C. 
Okay, so if you have a case with non-small cell, you can say I will use chemo radiotherapy. That's not a problem. Endovascular stents are being increasingly popular, uh, but the need for long-term anticoagulation is an issue with them. And that is something that's still being discussed, hence the, the evidence is not yet very clear whether you need to give them lifelong anticoagulation or not. Uh, but it is an issue. We don't know what is the correct answer for that. Uh, but in, in, if you want to avoid that, then dual platelet inhibition for three months, uh, use of aspirin and clopidogrel is the recommendation now uh, that has come out of literature. So dual platelet inhibition is what you have to say in the exam. Uh, RCTs uh, for most recommendations are lacking. Uh, we are making recommendations now on the basis of case series and uh, expert opinion. So there are very few people who have huge volumes of uh, studies which are telling us uh, what is the outcome for these patients. Thank you very much. Quite a straightforward technique, but it is definitely worth knowing because you will get a question, question in the FRCS uh, asking you about this. Okay, all right. So anybody wants to ask me any questions? Simple topic but definitely worth knowing and a few points which i brought out are from the literature thank you guys come on question hi this is dr abhijit here uh, hi dr abhijit uh, any specific indications where uh, you would like to take patients to operation theater directly instead of even thinking about taking them to cath lab to put stent or anything not nowadays <laughs> Not nowadays. Because we had three situations where we had to, in fact, take up this patient for emergency sternotomy in lateral positions. Patient presented wow. with cerebral edema and also with severe strider, which were not getting relieved even with intubation. We were able to pass in a reinforced, wire reinforced tube, but in supine position, patient was not able to maintain. So we had to do a phlebotomy and take up patient for an emergency sternotomy in lateral position. I mean, especially in a place where you really do not have the luxury of cath lab, even if you have cath lab people who are actually good enough to, you know, kind of take up patients who are having sure. severe strider and able to do stenting. Yeah, but, but that is not a shortfall of the technique. It's a shortfall of expertise. Yeah, right. So, you know, that will happen no matter where you are. A shortfall of expertise, these are all uh, difficult okay. situations. And, and these guys come in acutely unwell. So you have to do whatever it takes to save the patient. Uh, I personally, fortunately, work in centers where I have yeah. had good support. But if I was in a center where there was nothing else available and the patient is dying in front of me, I would open the chest. I agree with you. But that's very, very rare. I have touch would not be in that situation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. But, but good point you've made. Yeah. You know, particularly because we have a lot of people from countries where all these fancy equipments may not be available. And so we need to know what else to yes. do in that situation. Okay, next question, please. Uh, hi. Hi, is uh, that, yes. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Yashwin there. Okay, so uh, basically I just want to ask two questions. This is regarding SVC, uh, chronic SVC thrombosis. So as you said, in all these chronic patients, innominate can be uh, uh, kind of ligated. So what is the proximal extent of IJV to which we can safely anastomose? I mean, is, do you take any level which is safe? Uh, and second question is, uh, these patients, they present with a lot of collaterals. And suppose they become symptomatic with these collaterals. They have some epigastric pain or they develop some perisophageal paralysis. Uh, would you recommend surgery or uh, should we still you know, continue with some conservative kind of management if they are otherwise asymptomatic besides this pain? Okay, so let's talk about your first question. Uh, the anastomosis should be done as distal as possible rather than as proximal as possible. Uh, so, which means that you try to come as close to the heart as possible. Okay, you, there is no guideline which says you can, uh, there is a cutoff for what is the level that you can go. Uh, yeah, but you, you try to maintain the subclavian and the IJV uh, uh, point. Uh, but sometimes if you if you have to go beyond that, then you place a, a subclavian graft as well. Uh, I know of at least one situation where we had to place in a subclavian graft in addition to SVC and IGV. But the more complex reconstruction that you do, the more are the chances of uh, failure. 
uh, and thrombosis and thrombolysis, uh, thrombosis happening in these uh, graphs. So there is no cutoff that has been mentioned. Uh, so we, we have cut off the left side and blocked it off and done just the right side. We have only done SVC to SVC. We've put in an interposition graph. I, I have been involved in one case where we did the subclavian, but I, I personally don't like it. I don't think uh, that gives you good outcomes in the long term uh, with these patients. Uh, bottom line is it's not about the SVC or the IG. The bottom line is zero resection because no matter what you do, when you go into these situations, you always go in with an idea of R0 resection. So you have to do whatever it takes to get the tumor out. Debulking is not a good surgery and it's very unfortunate that in India many times I get uh, this uh, discussion happening where people say I will go ahead and debulk the tumor. That is not a good oncological principle. If you are going to operate, you must always go in with an idea of R0 resection. But of course within the limits of uh, you know having a live patient come out on the other side. So that is why you cannot say what is the level of resection that you can do uh, of the SVC. I never know how much of SVC I need to take out when I go in. It's always on table when you see, I'm looking at the tumor, I'm not looking at the SVC. You understand that? So I really need to make sure that uh, the SVC is, uh, the tumor is out rather than the SVC because reconstruction can be done. So that's you number might. one. Number two, uh, what was your second question? In symptomatic uh, collateral. Yeah, basically, yeah, collateral is causing... The, yeah, nowadays in this uh, day and age, uh, because of interventional radiology being available, any symptomatic uh, collateral can be dealt with. Uh, no matter what problem they are causing, you can always uh, go in and embolize them. So uh, managing the collateral is not so much of a problem. The problem is managing the primary pathology. And uh, it completely depends on the histology of the pathology. Now, if you go in and operate and it turns out to be lymphoma, you have done no favor to this patient because there is no role for surgery in lymphoma. So in answer to your question, the bottom line is it completely depends on the histology of the, of the problem. And most of the times you might actually end up giving chemotherapy or chemoradiotherapy and then operating. I have personally not been in a situation where I've got to crash into the chest and uh, take out the tumor. Uh, never a good idea. I always believe that, uh, uh, and emergency surgery in the anterior mediastinum uh, is, is not good. It doesn't give you good results. No matter how experienced you are, it never gives you more good results. So you have to try and optimize your surgical skills by using the other technologies of emergency. Does that make sense, Yash? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The only thing with what I was trying to ask you was like, if the patient is having epigastric pain, and it's very difficult to find out which collateral actually is you know giving rise to this pain. It's peripatetic one or some other one. So I mean that is one point. Secondly, when I was talking so about the idea of thrombosis, pain is your only issue. Yes, if pain is your only issue, I would not operate on the patient to take away the obstruction because pain is a very very random thing. It is very difficult to localize the pain. I am talking mm -hmm. about you know I'm talking about hematemesis, massive bleeding, things like that, or huge. Uh, uh, subcutaneous, uh, you know, uh, hematomas and things like that. That is what I was talking about. Pain and is something you, you never know where the pain is coming from. I would not embolize something for pain, for sure. I would give him okay. other therapies for pain. Fair enough. Uh, the other thing which I was asking was this IJV thrombus, suppose it is going right up to the base of the skull. Will you still intervene? If <laughs> Probably not. I would say my prayer and go home. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would, I would not. Yes. I want an alive patient. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. Thank you. That is certainly beyond the scope of my expertise for sure. So I would not operate on somebody like that. If I may ask just one more question. But, but the, important the... Thing is, the important thing is you can actually anticoagulate these patients nowadays and with good anticoagulation, these thrombus may dissolve. So that's the other thing. You have options available to you. One last question. Who is doing all these interventions? The cardiologist or the uh, cardiac surgeons? Uh, the interventions depends on what center you work in. Uh, we have... Um, uh, it, I, I work in four or five different centers and every center does it differently. 
uh, the cardiac surgeons are frequently involved in the surgical side of things. Uh, but when it is endovascular, in fact, I have had a radiologist who does really great endovascular work. And I've also had a cardiologist who does very great endovascular work. And so I will offer it to the cardiologist or the uh, uh, interventional radiologist. It completely depends on your center, whoever is, you know. I don't know too many uh, cardiac surgeons who are doing great endovascular surgery at the moment. So it is, it is dependent on, on center to center. Lot of but I, I think we have done a huge disfavor by letting go of endovascular work. I really think, uh, you know, I think the, the mistake started when we were so focused on doing CABGs that we thought that, you know, we don't need to learn how to do a basic uh, coronary angiogram. That is where the first mistake happened. And I think, you know, not just my generation, but the generation before me probably made that huge mistake of letting the interventional cardiology take over all of the angiography and the endovascular work. I think it's a huge problem. So on the thoracic side, I do not let any end intervention or endo endobronchial work go directly to the pulmonologist. I am always involved. We have a hybrid theater. I want to be there. I want to do everything with the pulmonologist. Even if they want to do it, I'll stay with them so that my trainees learn all these techniques. Because tomorrow the pulmonologist will take over and then you are left with nothing. So I think we have made a huge mistake as a, as, as a community, as cardiac surgeons, because not, I, I think 95% of cardiac surgeons wouldn't know how to do a coronary angina. That is the reality. And we've been discussing this in the academic council of IX again and again. And I think it is time that we learn how to do simple angiograms. And then, you know, I mean, what is so difficult about doing a stand for God's sake? <laughs> So maybe it's okay. time to reclaim what we lost. Uh, we have to reclaim, but it's it might be a bit too late now because the other guys have gone way ahead. That's the problem. So, okay, let, let's you, stick to the topic. Thank you very much, Yash. Next question, please. Sir, good evening. Hi, Vivek. How are you? Hi, good evening, sir. Thank you very much for the wonderful Hi, lecture. Thank you. Uh, sir, I had uh, one uh, uh, doubt. Actually, uh, sir, um, since we are giving anticoagulation to these patients, um, mm -hmm. what is the role for um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, checking on a coagulation profile? And if so, what would the ta target PT-INR be? Uh, usually, uh, if you're looking at the INR, you've got to be at least twice the recommended limit. So, you know, you look for 2 to 2.5, but you really don't it's not like valve surgery, but still you have a risk of uh, having a, a thrombo thrombolysis, uh, a risk of a thrombus forming if you haven't adequately anticoagulated the patient. But the balance is between doing the therapeutic uh, part of the surgery versus the anticoagulation because you're anticoagulating for the SVC, that's great. But really the problem is outside the SVC. There's a tumor sitting in the mediastinum. So you really need to balance it out. And so, you know, most of, uh, you, very often when you're doing treatment, you, you can't even do a needle biopsy. When the INR is two, you know, you can't even do a needle biopsy to, to establish whether this is uh, non-small lung cancer or small cell lung cancer. So sometimes you have to downgrade the anticoagulation purely to allow the uh, diagnostics and the therapeutic uh, modalities to take place. But usually twice the normal limit is what we go for. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks. Sir, Any other questions? Yes, yeah, Vikas. Sir, how do you manage... It One minute, because be number. before you ask me the question, I just want to sort of ask, offer to you guys. I have a little small topic, uh, which is video editing for surgeons. Okay? Yes, sir. So yes, if, sir. You, if you think that we have got time and you want to hear about it, I'm very happy to just talk a little bit about video editing. It's just Definitely something sir. different. From the if you if you guys are not tired from having no no not in too sir. many uh, lectures we are Let's tired of leaving all lesson. <laughs> okay, so come on. Uh, so that's why yes, I, I kept the second topic very light and uh, yes, you know non-academic so that you yes, you yes, you'll enjoy. So yes, Vikas, yes, ask me the question. So how do we manage if the stent has got thrombus? It's re-stenting or surgery? <laughs> Anticoagulation. <laughs> Systemic anticoagulation and lot of prayers and prasad. Prasad, yes. <laughs> okay. Very difficult situation, my friend. This patient no, has already surgery. got. Definitely not surgery. 
no 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 i would not operate certainly i would not operate because you got to remember it's not about the svc obstruction it's the not fact that he got svc obstruction because of disease which has infiltrated into the svc these are not yes. guys who are going to live 10 years so may i just say to get involved with that situation may i just Honestly, give a comment not. please do who is that yeah this is abhijit here see uh, in a, in a in a surgical options what we are thinking is bypass but the occlusion rate in venous bypass is extremely high to the extent Absolutely of 70 right. to 80% within 6 months yeah. i mean same thing even with stent the yeah. occlusion rate in venous stenting is very very high yeah absolutely right so really whenever we do bypass we are not doing bypass to relieve svc obstruction we are doing bypass to relieve cancer that is what you got to remember Yes. Yes. The philosophy yes. is different. The philosophy is, I want to the same answer as I gave to the previous question about the extent of the venous resection. My philosophy when I go in is not to relieve SVC obstruction. My philosophy is to take away the cancer. That is the reason why I will operate. I will never operate now in the current era. I will never operate to relieve SVC obstruction. Almost. Never. Okay. All right. Any yes. more questions, guys? Go ahead quickly. No, sir. No more so questions. Thank you. Everybody is happy. Sir, Do we have time? Thing. Sir, just Sorry, one little one... thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andre, come in. Hey, good uh, to see your face. Agent. It's well lit up. <laughs> <laughs> so today for a change. Yeah, tell yes, me. Sir, so the uh, preferred agent for anti-coagulation uh, because uh, uh, it clearly says uh, in recommendations that. until an analyst it's a post mitral valve replacement patient or a patient who uh, does does not have mitral valve disease uh, the agent should be one of those uh, direct thrombin inhibitors like pega uh, patran dabigatran and uh, uh, those couple of fancy things uh, other two i i am Six, not a cardiologist the only two i know about is aspirin and clopidogrel <laughs> i would take cardiology advice on whatever is the latest uh, anti coagulation but uh, the papers at the moment are talking about aspirin and clopidogrel the new newer ones the uh, i don't i can't even pronounce that name but uh, they they are started being using them in the in uk in london uh, but uh, still we are old timers i am happy with aspirin but if the cardiologist advises me otherwise i'll go with whatever they advise me 